Hello everyone, this is Girish Chowdhury coming to you from 10,000 feet in the sky. Sorry I couldn't make it to the actual talk because of emergency travel, but this is the next best thing and I hope that with the AI farms and Tinerop collaboration, there'll be many more opportunities to do this. So anyway, I'm gonna to talk to you about the work we've been doing in autonomous robotics for agriculture. So I'm originally from India, but I've spent two and a half years in Germany, in Braunschweig at the German Aerospace Center. So I have a very close relationship with Germany. And ich bin aus der Übung, aber ich kann auch Deutsch sprechen. But today I'll do my talk in English. So today I am in the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, Associate Professor of uh, Computer Science and Agricultural Engineering. And my group works mostly on field robotics, particularly on autonomy for field robotics. We are a very diverse set of students um, from electrical engineering, computer science, agricultural engineering, mechanical engineering. But we're all driven by the need to make robots more autonomous so that they could do useful things in the real world, and particularly in agriculture. We want to make robots that cause massive scale landscape changes. We want to make robots that terraform. Elon is making the rockets to go to Mars. We want to make the robots that make Mars green. But we've realized that there's a lot of work to be done here on Earth. So, and most of that is in agriculture. Our focus is on making robotics work for agriculture, particularly to make sustainable farming possible. And specifically to reduce the labor bottlenecks that are throttling sustainable farming practices. As we all know, we need to produce a lot more to feed the 10 billion population we're about to become. The issue is not that we couldn't make all that food, but the issue is that the cost of making that food, particularly the environmental cost, is out of balance. We, we need to come up with new agricultural practices such that we bring that more into balance. Nowhere is this more of an urgent need than in Illinois and in the Midwest with corn and soybean farming, which is highly resource and input intensive. It's also really not that profitable anymore with expenses growing far higher than income. And the conventional methods of doing this type of agriculture, which have relied heavily on chemicals, have begun to fail, and particularly herbicides are beginning to fail. Soils are under, under stress and are only capable of producing the yields that they do today with lots of chemical input. And yields are falling behind demand. So there's really a need to do something different than what we're doing. And we think that small robots working in teams can really enable new sustainable practices that aren't possible by automating larger equipment. In particularly, we've been working on under canopy phenotyping, mechanical weeding, spot side dressing of nitrogen, cover crop planting, which I'll talk about today, and plant manipulation. So we're not the first people to say this. Dino Rob does the same thing, makes robot. There's a Bosch robot, um, also from Germany. There's a lot of work in agricultural robotics in the US and also in Australia. But the challenges, and in Britain actually, the challenges are essentially in autonomy. I think there's enough knowledge out there on how to make agricultural robots. We're learning more as we go forward, but really how do we make them autonomous so that the costs of operation can be brought down? And this is a hard challenge. Agriculture is a very difficult domain. We have to deal with very large scale scale. Data is very different than what you see in benchmark data sets and the environment is very unstructured. And on top of that, we have to bring the levels of autonomy up while bringing the costs down. So that's very different than other autonomy markets such as autonomous vehicles where lots of expensive sensors are used. We really don't have that luxury in agriculture. So how do we get there? Autonomy is a combination of perception, planning, and control. And in my group, we work on all three things. 
But the key thing that we realize that even though we can do all these different types of algorithms to do these things individually, the trick is in making them all work together in real world conditions, especially when, in this case, half the wing of the airplane falls off. This is actually research that I did back in my PhD days in Georgia Tech. It was a part of my thesis. How do you create algorithms that will enable robots to adapt to unforeseen situations such as this? In this particular work, a lot of this was based off of heuristics, but the main thing that we've been doing in these past, I would say eight years, is trying to get rid of heuristics one at a time and making systems that are able to learn from real world experience so that they can operate in the real world. The first thing you need for reliable autonomy is good platforms. A lot of agricultural robots were inspired by larger vehicles, such as tractors. But one of the things we realized as we started getting into agriculture was that what works at large scale or large size doesn't necessarily work when you try to reduce it and have it go through rows. For example, here, this robot barely fits through rows and it killed a plant right there. So one of my graduate students had this idea. Why don't we make a very little drone on the ground? Because we were doing a lot of drone work otherwise, uh, aerial drones. And he uh, led a team that 3D printed a robot. That led to a lot of interest with people saying, wow, that's such a good idea. Why don't we have these little robots? can operate in fields. And this led to formation of EarthSense, the startup that I co-founded. And they took over this idea of making small robots through the ARPA-E project, where they were the commercialization partners. They hired real designers. And then this is what we have today, the TerraSentia, extremely rugged robotic system made for field conditions. TerraSentia, and we've made 100 of these to date. Not only is it rugged, it has uh, brushless DC motors. It can deal with uh, water very easily and all kinds of different conditions, but it's also very powerful. So here you see it operating in water. It, op it can operate in more rocky terrain that you see here, more gravelly terrain that you're seeing here uh, in orchards, in more um, grassy terrain, and it's a uh, and this is in India, actually, so much more arid terrain, and it's light enough that you can carry it in your hand. But even so that it's so light, the magic of brushless DC motors, rugged construction with vacuum-formed plastic, metal chassis, and LiPo battery makes the system extremely powerful. So here you see one of our engineers loading it up, then sitting on it, and then this little robot weighing 20 kilos can pull a tractor that weighs more than half a ton. And I think that's amazing. I think there's a lot of promise in the technology that's been propelled by electric scooters and the likes that we as roboticists can use to make a whole new genre of robotics, of robots. So now that brings us to the question of autonomy. How do we make these robots more autonomous? Of course, the place to start is GPS, and we've done a lot of work there. Um, one of the challenges with GPS-based autonomy is how do you deal with slip? Because these robots drive with slip, they're skid to steer. Um, so some of the work that my uh, ex-postdoc, now professor at Oklahoma, University of Oklahoma did, Aircon, uh, was modeling these slips and then creating this architecture that we still use today of nonlinear moving horizon, Satan parameter estimator, and nonlinear monitor control. And I won't, I'll spare you the details. You can read the number of papers he's written, including the RSS 2018 best paper, best systems paper award paper, where he has formalized his architecture and created an elegant system that will enable robots to drive using just GPS and IMU data. He's shown that you can get really good tracking error and you can tolerate some GPS loss. But the challenge is once you start going under the plant canopy, which is where you need to be if you're a small robot, GPS starts to become 
a lot less reliable. For example, here you see that the GPS varies between 0 and 40 centimeters, the error. Whereas it should be between two centimeters because this is actually RTK or the or differential GPS, real-time kinematic GPS. So this led to us thinking about, well, how can we navigate using perceptive sensors rather than proprioceptive sensors such as GPS? So the simplest way to formulate this problem, and of course there are SLAM type formulations you can make which are a lot more complicated and actually tend to not work because of all the similarity, visual similarity. The simplest way to formulate this problem is to find the row. It's similar to the row following problem or the wall following problem, wall following behavior that uh, the Roomba used to become a successful Roomba. So figure out the distance to the row and the angle with respect to the row. And this is quite challenging when you do it with LiDAR. And LiDAR is a place to start, of course, because of the small data problem. So you have a 2,000 data points that you have to use to figure out where the rows are. And you can see it's quite challenging. The point cloud is extremely noisy compared to when you're an indoor and facing a wall. You have to filter it. You can read about how we did this in our 2019 paper that appeared in the Journal of Field Robotics. The idea, the, in, essentially, we, we sped up the RANSAC algorithm by creating a heuristic that filtered the middle part and then tried to fit the, the, the line to the most likely points. This works reasonably well when the LiDAR is relatively less obstructed. So in this case, you can see that I can see the plants. The plants are barely as tall as the LiDAR, so it's not the easiest case, but you can do it. Then you can kick the robot and it still works well. And this is something that we do uh, really well in my group, I think, is that we really test our robots to the extreme, right? Because it's easy to have them just go straight lines and in a, get enough data to write a paper, but that doesn't really make field robots. A field robot has to survive kicking. See, that's what I teach my students, and I think uh, you'll see that they take that lesson uh, very seriously. So this technology is actually now being commercialized by EarthSense, the company that I co-founded, uh, which is using this plus a lot of the analytics that they develop. And you'll see a glimpse of them. I won't really talk about them too much, but they can do things like find stems and estimate their width using data, the camera data and LiDAR data. They can find years and estimate their height using camera data and other data. They can count plants, so they can detect and track plants. They can also do um, plant height estimation and full 3D reconstruction. Let me show you a quick video of the ear height algorithm that they've developed. Uh, so here's the robot TerraSensha. It, it drives with the LiDAR like we discussed. It has a camera module up here. And it's finding all these ears of corn, which are really difficult to detect. It's classifying them as drooping or upright, and then it's estimating their height. And once this is done, it's able to deliver this data, and this is the crops, the NSF crops project that we're, uh, who we're working with, in a field map setting where each of these blocks represents different plots, so that the scientists can use that data to make quick judgments between what's happening. And they can do this over tens of thousands of plots. And the correlations are really good. So I think there's a lot of promise in this type of technology. And I think specific, specifically for under canopy phenotyping, this technology is ready to be scaled up. And this has been recognized by many places, including the New York Times. So the next challenge is, well, how do we bring this technology to the farmer? Today's farming is heavily dependent on chemicals. Chemicals are failing, like I've said, herbicides in particular are failing, which is causing a massive herbicide resistant crisis. And this could cost us a lot in terms of the yields that we lose. And on the other side of the world, in India where I was born, they, the farm sizes are much smaller, uh, you know, two and a half acres. And there the problem is flipped. They can't really afford the large tractors that can deploy the chemicals. So they end up resorting to human labor. And the human labor isn't really paid well. So it's very difficult for them to find labor even with a billion people in India. So it's really strange. The problems of agriculture are you know, in a very interesting place because farmers get squeezed 
on the bottom from the bottom by input prices which is seeds and chemicals and on the top by commodity pricing so even though it looks like the labor and this is only in the US the cost of labor is reducing the cost of inputs has astronomically increased and has surpassed even the cost of um, owning tractors so that's really interesting that how heavily dependent on chemicals we've become and if you look at most of the midwest it's kind of become a corn and soybean desert now i'm talking about iowa illinois indiana and you know parts of missouri mississippi and you know if you fly um, over the midwest for example all you see is barren land over you know many 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 uh, thousands of acres so what is a way to change that one way you could change that is by planting cover crops so cover crops are crops that are planted during the season or at the end of the season after the main crop is done and what they do is they cover the land they basically like grass or different types of nitrogen fixing varieties they suppress weeds and they enrich the soil they also sequester carbon which has become an exciting topic recently but the problem with cover cropping is that the options that farmers have which is either aerial spraying of cover crop seeds which costs too much money and wastes a lot of seeds after harvest spraying of cover crop seeds which is often too late because it gets cold in the northern latitudes or in season with a large tractor which causes crop damage so we had this idea what if we make small robots that can go through the canopy carry seeds and distribute them under the canopy all the way from july after the main crop is matured so that the plants get a lo longer time cover crop plants get a longer time to establish we found out when we did economic analysis with people like madhu khanna and shadia tala economists from the university of illinois that this could cost a lot less than tractors and significantly less actually so the question is can robots like this convert the corn and soybean desert that we live in in the midwest to a much more greener lusher landscape in order to do this the robots have to be more autonomous they don't just they can't just like follow the row they have to be able to get in and out of rows recognize where they are and deal with different situations that they encounter the robot that we have has ross running on the nuc and a um, raspberry pi system that's running the lower level controllers it has to exhibit what we call the full path navigation behavior which includes the row following behavior but then also maneuvers outside this involves a switch from row following to gps or other following um, path following and it sounds easy but it's not really that simple so here is an example of how that architecture comes about we have the proprioceptive sensors which uh, are our imus and encoders which measure acceleration angular rates and encoders we have our perceptive sensors which are extraceptive sensors which are measuring the distance and angle to the row and then we have some notion of where we are in the world although it's not super accurate uh, well it's accurate sufficiently accurate to know where we are in the field but not accurate enough to just navigate with all of this is fused together with uh, mhe and then we create mpc output paths which provide the angular rate and velocity for the robot to drive and in our the way we design our algorithm we are more grounded in robotics so instead of learning everything we use what we know so we know that the robot models are known and uh, you know you can model uh, uncertainties due to slipping but essentially use dubin's car type models we know that we can use things like kalman filters or mhes to fuse sensors and moving horizon estimators and all sensor fusion work that's been existing in the robot robotics literature for a while and combined together you can create algorithms that switch between different behaviors so in this case row following which is a very robust behavior that that, that we've shown you before with lidar and then switch to gps in benign conditions this seems this types of switching heuristic behavior seems to work fairly well so here the robot switches recognizes it's out of the row switches to gps then drives enters the row again um, uses the lidar 
to follow the row again. This works well. You can add some smarts to it so that it behaves uh, better in weird conditions. For example, here there's a lot of mud peaking. So even if it can make the turn, uh, somehow it doesn't make the, um, the turn perfectly. So it ends up crashing. But then you can add logic to detect the crash and then retry the maneuver. And this works most of the time, especially in this case, there's nothing behind the robot, so you can just back out and go. But if you have something behind, it's not going to work. So I think even though the distance between interventions are increasing with these types of heuristic uh, mismatched behaviors, we need something else to do things better. The GPS plus LiDAR doesn't seem to be enough. So one of the things we have done is use vision as one of the next modalities. And it makes a lot of sense because visually, humans definitely navigate visually. So it makes sense that robots should be able to do it, but it's quite hard because crop keeps changing between the different growth seasons. Uh, growth stages. You have to be able to deal with all of it. So in 2021 RSS, we published a paper that uh, talks about crop follow and algorithm that takes an image and generates directly the distance ratio and an angle from the robot. So sorry, the distance ratio and an angle with respect to the row. And then this is then fused into our modular architecture, MPC architecture to create our robot control. This required labeling of data sets. We, we labeled 20 plus 1,000 images, and actually that number is growing quite, quite, quite large, and we thank EarthSense for helping us do this. Um, and basically the labels are what we call vanishing point labels, right? So uh, two lines that are drawn across the, the crop and then a horizon. When the horizon is not visible, we use the fact that corn is more or less straight to estimate the horizon. And similarly, you can do other uh, crops. This works well, and I'll spare the detail, but we, have, we can correct for tilt, we can correct for the roll, and then create a fairly good ground truth. And we validated it fairly good in the paper, obviously got accepted 25 kilometers, and we were pretty proud of that. And that included a lot of uh, difficult uh, conditions like this. But this, you know, and, and we were very excited about this, and it was, we tried to deploy it, and uh, EarthSense took the algorithm, and you know, try to make sense of it based off of the paper. But then we very quickly found out that what works in academia, unfortunately, doesn't seem to work in the in the real world. And this is something I think we lose out when we just write papers um, and don't try to scale robotics. And that's one of the reasons why we don't see as many robots as we see, for example, data set systems or machine learning where people have actually worked on that scale. So what happened is that between robots, cameras are calibrated differently. And you can calibrate them all day long. They still lose calibration. So because this calibration is lost, the ground truthing is lost. Because the ground truthing is lost, the model starts to have a bias. And the bias is different on different robots. So as it is, this algorithm doesn't, I mean, it works well on robots on which it was trained, but not so much on other robots. The good news is that these types of algorithms still work way better than SLAM works today. And this is Vince Mono, uh, Vince Fusion. And actually one of my students is now trying a bunch of different algorithms. He's finding something similar, that it's hard to find points. Uh, and then there's a lot of drift that generates. It's difficult for this, this SLAM by itself to work. And then some most of the SLAM algorithms, like, like recently we were looking at an optical flow-based package. It was like seven gigabytes. There's no way this is actually going to work on a real robot. So it feels like in academia, we kind of stop just after proving feasibility. We're like, oh, we're done. But the real world, you know, we need to make software that actually is deployable on real robots. Regardless, using pruning and other types of techniques that I'll talk about in a few minutes, this algorithm, the crop follow, when it works, can actually make the robot drive faster than LiDAR and on a lower cost computer, um, Raspberry Pi especially when you use pruning. And of course, uh, the kick test works. So here's Arun, uh, who's kicking the robot now as it's trying to drive autonomously. And here you see that it's uh, also controlling the velocity. So there's an upgrade on the velocity controller from the LiDAR video that I showed you. And that helps it really quick, quickly correct um, the position. So these types of behaviors, again, have been emulated in the industry now. Uh, where they have like uh, row following 
and then switching out and collecting the data. So that seems to be working well. And so EarthSense deployed something similar on their cover crop robots, which I talked about before. They go from under the canopy using vision um, and then distribute the seeds under the canopy and this uh, results in cover crops. And this can be done all the way from July. Uh, you don't have to wait until September. And this, they, they did 100 acres last year. They plan to do a lot more this year. So we'll see how this technology scales. But at the lab, we are now very much interested in going beyond waypoints because planning paths for like even with the serpentine maneuvers is quite difficult. You have to sit there and plan paths, and even if you use shape files, RTK and shape files, there's often bias in GPS. So it's not that easy or good idea to rely on GPS. So one of the things we're working on is how can we free ourselves from waypoints? The algorithm we call that, our first algorithm in this area, we call it Waypath. And it's actually going to appear in IROS 2022 and also RAL. And so what Wayfast does is take sensor data and it generates a traversability map from the sensor data. And the sensor data is a RGBD camera data. And it fuses that also with the MHE EKF baseline modular controller and it's able to then generate a path. So the good thing about this as compared to something like Badger, which actually also learns the robot model, is that you can use a known robot model and just generate the traversability map. So we've been testing this quite extensively, and you'll see, you can read about it all in the IROS paper, but in exotic locations such as Puerto Rico, uh, and in, uh, in snow, and in all kinds of different uh, environments. Uh, and we see that it, it, it ends up performing much better than Badger with much lesser data, um, and it's more modular. So we're really excited about this, and excited about this direction of where studying traversability or learning traversability can take us while using what is known about the robots already and not learning everything from scratch. And we're also excited about pruning and minimizing the computational load on the robot so that the cost of the hardware that's on the robot can be brought down. And here we are working with other computer scientists such as Victor Madbe who work more on architectures so that we don't have to use NUX uh, or even GPUs and just get away with something really cheap like a Raspberry Pi 4. We're also working with manipulation experts such as Girish Krishnan and Matya Gazola uh, to create soft arms that can do things in polycultures. And here's one of the robots that we've developed, which has a hybrid arm and a hybrid arm, a heart and a soft arm, so that when the berry is on the periphery, you don't really need to extend the arm, but when the berry is inside, the arm can be extended. There's a lot of potential in these types of systems. The key thing that we need to figure out is visual control. So we published uh, recently a paper in RoboSoft that appeared earlier this year, also in RAL, on using learning to do visual survey. So here's our system, uh, an example of, uh, there's a lot to be done here. This is still in a structured environment, uh, but this is trying to achieve the target image through just the camera data. So looking ahead, I think traversability is certainly a big problem. Uh, edge cases and dealing with uh, transfer is an important problem. Plant manipulation, of course, conformal moving, cluttered occlusion. This is becoming a bigger and bigger problem in my group. Reliability with multiple sensors, fault tolerance, cost reduction, multi-agent coordination, human-robot interaction. These, I think, are really key problems. Um, and of course, making the hardware work at the edge and across multiple robots. We have the AI Institute at Illinois, and we're very happy to be working with Tina Rob pretty soon uh, through an approved NSF proposal. Uh, and we, of course, have the autonomous farm for which I'm the chief scientist. And now we have the farm of the future, which is the single NIFA USDA funded farm of the future in Illinois. And here we have the opportunity to bring together again lots of different technology and industry to make a uh, cohesive setup for thinking about future of agriculture. So we welcome people to join us in realizing this dream of autonomy for agriculture. 
And while I can't join you today, uh, three of my very bright and amazing students slash research scientists will be able to join you, which is Arun, Matthias, and Naveen. So feel free to ask them questions. They can probably answer them way better than I can. But if there aren't any that they can answer, I will be happy to answer them later. Thank you very much and hope to see you soon.